We'll see, I need to put my hair up. Oops. Okay, well. Hello, everyone coming in. Happy International Women's Day, everybody. We love to hear where you're you're watching in from. If you want to put in the chat where you're coming uh, watching from, we'd love to see. Budapest is the first one I see. Hello, Toronto, and DC. Santa Fe, hello. New York, hello everybody. Hi from Georgia. Happy International Women's Day. <laughs> You'll hear that a lot today. Portugal, hello. Oh, I see Lucha. Hi, Lucha. One of our uh, paper routes artists. We're going to give it just a couple minutes and then we'll get started. So next we need Nimwa themed music, Laura. <laughs> I'll add it to my list. Yes. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I think we go one more minute and then we'll get started. Hi, everybody. Oh, hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to uh, pass it over to start us off this morning for this international uh, Women's Day celebration with director Susan Sterling. Hi, Susan. Hi, Carolyn, and thank you and welcome everybody. Uh, happy Women's History Month. And obviously we're delighted to celebrate with you today the launch of our 2021 uh, hashtag five women artists. Um, International Women's Day, of course, is our favorite holiday at, at the National Museum of Women in the Arts. I, I think Hall Halloween probably comes second. Um, so, in talking about hashtag five women artists, um, I wanted to give some background. And I think we've all seen over the past several years uh, how social media can really level the playing field in a lot of different ways for people all across the country and all across the world. And for a young and vibrant museum, a mid-sized museum like uh, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, it really extends our reach in ways that are truly important to our mission and our message. We can be in dialogue with you and with a huge public uh, to try and change the social landscape for women artists. And then by extension, we're also helping women in general. And I see that especially happening, happening here in the US and also in Europe and South America at this point, because we also have a wonderful network of uh, state and international committees. Now, as to today, 
I thought I'd give you some background on how this campaign got started. And the campaign is really based on a question that our founder, Wilhelmina Cole Holiday, asked people when she met with them as she was beginning to create the museum. She would usually sit down at a lunch or in a meeting room and after pleasantries, she would ask her guests to name three to five, five men artists. And they would come up with Leonardo and Michelangelo and Donatello and maybe Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning or whoever. But then, and she would nod politely and be very nice about it, but then she would turn the tables and she would ask them to name five women artists. And there was often stone silence. And that's how she got people to think differently about women in the arts. So it is really a tribute to the brilliance of our founders, simple first question that NIMWA began its hashtag five women artists social media campaign in 2016. It was with great hope, just as Mrs. Holiday had at the beginning, and there was a ton of sweat equity from the staff, which still continues. So when we started in 2016, it was just about six months after the UN had implemented the, its 2030 agenda for sustainable development. Those goals had come out in 2015 and goal number five, I love the number five, was uh, gender equity. So we were totally on brand with that and our timing for the campaign really was aligned with other important uh, international initiatives. But what we didn't know was how much of a watershed year 2016 would be in the fight for gender parity across American culture. Uh, women, for example, in Europe were the main subject for the Davos summit that year. And then, of course, the issue of women's equality spread across the globe through the mass movements we now know, including the women's marches and then the Me Too movement. So this was really the advocacy environment into which we launched hashtag five women artists. And uh, this drive on all these different fronts for gender equity really is part of the story of our campaign's success, as well as the efforts that we make ourselves. So if you fast forward to 2017, which was the second year we did the campaign, we really focused on tasking um, staff and visitors of cultural institutions with the job of ferreting out works by women artists uh, in their collections and posting them to social media so that we could showcase the contributions of women in the arts as it was being shown by other organizations. Our goal was really to have uh, directors of museums, to have gallery owners, auction houses, cultural centers, to have all these sorts of organizations uh, take notice. And what they took notice of was there was often a dearth of women artists on their walls. So the point was well made. In 2018, the campaign challenged uh, participants to foreground uh, all women of color. In 2019, we asked participants to take a pledge to foreground women artists all year, not just during Women's History Month. And in 2020, we focused the campaign's attention on women artists who were tackling socially relevant issues, including climate change, continued with racial justice and LGBTQ plus rights. Now in March, 2021, we are expanding our signature hashtag five women artists social media campaign from a one month event during Women's History Month to an entire year's worth of activities. I have to say that the biggest reason or one of the biggest reasons we're taking this step is our concern that post pandemic women artists will lose ground in their struggle for equity in the arts. And on the good news front, uh, if we're successful, um, we can make that, uh, make women artists more relevant than ever. I am delighted to announce that our efforts are really being helped by some new support from the Sue Hostetler and Bo Wrigley Foundation. And that is going to help us to offer a full range of virtual programs, 
online experiences, as well as our on-site exhibitions and public programs uh, and education programs that will relate to hashtag uh, five women artists. And then of course, we're hosting this campaign itself uh, throughout the year. Uh, we are really galvanized and excited to take this next step forward in our development of the initiative. And we look forward to you, our audience's ongoing participation in the activities coming up this year. So thanks again for joining us today. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Emma Filar, who is our communications and marketing manager. Uh, she'll talk to you about the success of the yearly campaigns to date and what is planned uh, going forward. To my colleague, Emma, thank you very much. Thanks, Susan. Carolyn, if you wanna pop up the slides, we'll be on slide two. All right, great. Hi, everyone. Happy International Women's Day. Thanks so much for joining us again. Um, so here you'll see just some really high level stats from the campaign's history over the past five years. Um, by pretty much any metric that we've used to measure, the campaign has been, you know, a rousing success. After going viral that first year of 2016, participation has grown and it's really gotten to the point that Five Women Artist is a recognizable hashtag across social media. And as Susan mentioned, the attention that we've gotten has led to impressive growth on all of our social media channels, traffic to our website, which has just given us a much more powerful platform from which to champion women artists. You wanna to go to the next slide, Carolyn? And as she mentioned, it's truly a worldwide campaign. So here you see a map of all of the organizations that were involved just last year in 2020. Um, we've reached all seven continents, 57 countries, and over 1800 cultural organizations have participated in their own ways. Um, those organizations really do run the gamut from large museums and institutions like the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, the Louvre in Paris, to smaller museums and libraries like the Indiana University South Bend Civil Rights Heritage Center and the McGill University Library and Archives. So pretty much all types and sizes of arts organizations, galleries, media outlets, um, professional associations and other arts groups have answered the call, answered the question, can you name five women artists? And, and they've celebrated the contributions of women artists from their perspectives. I'm gonna go to the next slide. And it's really, it's impossible to pull out all the amazing interactions we've had online over the past couple of years. Um, engagement is super active. Uh, we've lots, seen lots of messages of support from all types of people across the internet. Um, and a lot of people express disbelief that people can't answer the question. Um, my personal favorite posts are those from folks who admit that they had trouble with the question, they're not sheepish about it, but that the campaign made them think about why that was and to investigate and learn more. You want to go to the next slide? Um, here's some other examples. We've also seen a lot of organizations that they take the hashtag and adapt it to apply to their own use case. So if you were to search out five women architects, five women filmmakers, five women composers, you know, anything like that. You'll find lots of posts there too from other um, groups. Unfortunately, this means that gender inequity exists in most professions, but you know, we have been glad to see that the campaign idea can translate so effectively for other industries. You wanna to go to the next slide, great. Um, so while all of that is super great and for social media and online content, and that is all driving awareness about gender inequity in the arts, we have also wanted to make sure that the campaign has real world extensions like Susan mentioned. Um, so in recent years, we have been pushing our followers and fellow arts organizations to expand beyond the internet. And they have answered that call. We have seen lots of pledges to purchase and show more work by women artists and for institutions to catalog their collections with an eye towards gender equity. Um, museums have hosted dozens of events inspired by five women artists. And there are now podcasts and blogs and whole merchandise lines that cite our campaign as inspiration. 
we go to the next slide. Um, a partnership with the Tate Museum in London was um, particularly substantive. We um, had it led to an interactive installation, exhibitions, online content, merchandise, collaborative programs, and the launch of two books all centered around five women artists and the contributions of women artists. Go to the next slide. Um, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston presented an exhibition called Women Take the Floor a few years ago, um, which showed artworks by women in their collection, along with a commitment to represent women artists with parity. And then if you go to the other side of the world, Know My Name is a multi-year gender equity initiative of the National Gallery of Australia. And that includes exhibitions, events, commissions, creative collaborations, publications, and partnerships. So those are just a very high level, small sample of the types of, of real world consequences that we're seeing from the campaign. And we are uh, you know, really proud of the way that the campaign has evolved and morphed over the years into something that others have taken as a call to action. Um, but of course we want it to continue. So if you go to the next slide, that's why we've expanded this effort beyond Women's History Month. And we've made an internal commitment to adopt the campaign across all of our departments and present programs and exhibitions that tie into the campaign. And that includes presenting programs like this one that you're all attending right now. So thank you. Um, and that is where I'll turn my time over to my colleague, Ginny Trainer, who will actually be teaching us about five amazing women artists in the NIMWA collection. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, so there's been a lot of talk so far, right, about five women artists. And if you can name five women artists, that is amazing. And congratulations. And maybe now challenge yourself to name 10, uh, 11, 12. If you can't name five women artists, um, the following is my gift to you. I'm going to talk about five women artists. Um, it's really kind of a a grab bag. Um, we've got, we're going to start in the 17th century. We're going to end up in the in the 20th century. Um, and so, if anyone asks you the question at some point, can you name five women artists after this? You will be prepared. Um, so, the first slide I'm showing you is a painting by a woman, Judith Leister, who lived in the Netherlands in the 17th century. Now, I want to preface my entire talk by saying. As long as humans have been creating art, there have been women artists. That sounds a little um, obvious to say, but um, I think nevertheless, it's important to say that because I, I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that. But yes, there have always been women artists um, in, in times and in places where you might not expect them, but they've always been there. Um, so the 17th century Netherlands um, was really a hotbed of artistic activity, and you are probably familiar with the artist Rembrandt, who lived during this time, as well as Johannes Vermeer. Uh, Judith Leister also lived during this time. She lived in the city of Harlem. That's the original Harlem with two A's, and she was the daughter of a brewer. Um, he didn't succeed, unfortunately, he went bankrupt, but Judith nevertheless persisted and um, went on to um, train with an artist uh, to become a painter. We don't know for sure, but we think she probably trained with Franz Hals, who also lived in the city of Harlem, um, and her style is very similar to hers, and so that's led scholars to believe she probably trained with him. Um, she was admitted into the Guild of St. Luke in Harlem in 1633, so around the time this painting was made. And that was important because in order to sell your work in the city uh, and in order to take on students, which was a source of income, you had to be a member of the Guild, which she was. Uh, she did have students, she had male students, and she actually took Franz Hals to court at a certain point um, for kind of stealing one of her students away. And, and she was successful um, and she kind of um, uh, got some, some money out of that um, exchange. So here you see what we call a genre scene or a scene of everyday life. Um, this is a, a, the concert or a merry company and you can see a woman in the center which is probably a self-portrait 
of Jude Leister. Um, if you are familiar with her self-portrait at the National Gallery of Art here in Washington, DC, you probably um, can see some similarities there. And then the figure in red on the right is most likely her husband, who was also an artist, Jan Mitza Molinar. And here she's, she's um, displaying this this trio of musicians, the woman is singing and you can see her hands um, kind of poised right above her knee. She's probably keeping time with it um, for the musicians. This is a really typical kind of scene that you would see um, in the Netherlands during this time period. These kind of um, scenes of everyday life were very popular. Now, Judith Leister married Molinar in 1636 and the pair moved to Amsterdam where he continued painting, but we don't have a lot of works extant from her after her marriage. And that's led to some speculation that perhaps, you know, once she got married and she had children, she had five children, um, you know, she wasn't able to paint um, as much. And I think there's probably some truth to that, but over the past 10, 20 years, there have been works that have um, come on the market that have been attributed to her to after that period. So I don't think she gave up painting completely. Um, I think it's also very likely that she assisted her husband um, in his studio practice. Okay, next slide, please. Now we're gonna jump ahead a few hundred years to the early 20th century. And for those of you who have been longtime members of NIMWA, this painting probably looks very familiar. Um, it's one that we reproduce very often uh, because it is so beautiful. And you can see that this painting as the Judith Leister just before it um, is from the Holiday Collection. So this, these two works were part of that initial gift of paintings that the Holidays gave to the museum when the museum opened. Um, this artist is Lilla Cabot Perry. And she's a Boston, she was a Boston native. And she interestingly was an artist who, who really became an artist rather late in life, meaning um, she got married, she had three children, and it was only then that she, she embarked upon her career as an artist. Um, initially, she took private lessons at the Cowell School of Art in Boston. But what really had a tremendous influence on her uh, and her art, her style of painting, was the trip in 1867 that her family took to Paris. And she was able to study at the Académie Julienne in Paris that summer. And in fact, the family returned to France uh, many summers in a row, renting a house in Giverny, which of course is where Claude Monet lived. And Lilla Cabot Perry and her family were actually neighbors of Claude Monet. Now Monet is kind of famous for not taking on students um, that, you know, that wasn't really his thing, wasn't interested in it, but um, he and Lilla Cab Perry were very friendly and he was very encouraging um, towards her and encouraged her to continue painting. And you can see that those lessons kind of of impressionism, um, the, the stylistic approach of Impressionism are really evident here in this painting of Lady with a Bowl of Violets. You can see this very kind of loose brushwork, uh, particularly in the lace on her, on her dressing gown. Um, in turn, Lilla Cabot Perry, when she came back to Boston, was a big proponent of Monet and Impressionism. And gave lectures about his work and encouraged her, her friends. Um, she moved in very wealthy circles. Uh, she encouraged her friends to purchase works of art by Monet and his fellow Impressionists. So she was a really important um, reason that Impressionism gained popularity in the United States. Um, another big influence on her was at the turn of the 20th century, she and her family went to Japan for a few years. Her husband had a, had a position at a university there. And the, the influence of Japanese art is not only um, really important for the Impressionists in general, but you can see the importance for Lilla Cabot Perry literally in this work here, because if you look at the upper right, hanging on the wall behind her is a framed Japanese print. So that's kind of her, um, her homage to 
um, her experiences in Japan. And like the Impressionists in France, she what she took from um, Japanese art, particularly woodblock prints, uh, was this kind of um, condensing of space, right? So more two-dimensional, everything's very close to the picture plane, as well as um, this kind of asymmetrical cropping of the images. Um, Perry exhibited her work at the Paris Salon and at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. She won medals for her paintings at important exhibitions in Boston, St. Louis, and San Francisco. And she was a really active uh, member in numerous arts organizations and was also on top of everything else, being an artist and a, and a mother, um, was a very well received poet. Um, and she published a few volumes of verse. All right, next slide, please. So um, we are kind of back in France and, and also kind of back in Boston. So this is an artwork by Louis Milo Jones, who like Perry was a native of Boston, uh, but from a completely different world than the very wealthy and white Willa Cabot Perry. Um, Lois Milo Jones, who was African American, studied art at the art school at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, but she is mostly um, associated with Washington, D.C., right here in Washington, D.C., because she spent close to 50 years teaching art at Howard University here in the District of Columbia. Um, over that time, um, in at Howard University, she helped train many of the most important African American artists um, of the 20th century, including Elizabeth Catlett, Martha Jackson Jarvis, David Driscoll, and Mary Lovelace O'Neill. So it's really hard to overstate the, the influence um, of the art program at Howard University for African American artists in the 20th century and the role that Lois Milo Jones played in that. Um, before I tell you a little bit more about that, I, I want to talk about the painting briefly that she did here. Um, she, like many artists, uh, including Cabot Perry, who we just heard about, um, traveled to France. I believe she also took classes at, um, at the Academie Julienne and returned uh, frequently over her summer breaks from, the, from teaching at the university um, to France. And this landscape was done on one of those trips. And you can really see the influence of post-impressionists like um, Paul Cezanne uh, in an image like this, really kind of um, beautiful um, swaths of color, kind of um, blocks of color. Lois Milo Jones was also um, an innovator really of um, scenes of African inspired works of art. And because she spent so much time in Paris, she was really involved um, with this movement called Nerritude, which in, in French really kind of translates to blackness. And it was just an awareness of the, the arts and the influence of African art and culture. And some of you may know that African art, particularly masks, were very influential to the Cubists like Picasso in the early 20th century. And so here's Lois, Lois Milo Jones um, kind of reclaiming right, the arts of Africa um, in her own artwork. Um, so again, that's, that's one of the things she's very well known for. It. And the Smithsonian American uh, Art Museum here in Washington, DC owns one of those works by her. Um, I want to come back to Washington DC very quickly before I move on because Lois Milo Jones opened a salon that she ran out of her studio called the Little Paris Group. And this was a group that of African American artists that could come together in her studio and um, continue their, their art lessons, exchange ideas, um, draw from a live model. And other members of this group included Alma Thomas, who was the first graduate of the art <clears throat> program at Howard University in 1924. Um, and so she and Lois Milo Jones together um, kind of ran this salon for, um, for African-American artists in DC during that time. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so now you can name two women artists. 
And the third one that I'd like to talk about is Shireen Nishant. And this is a work called On Guard. It's one of her um, earlier works. You can see it's from 1996. Now, Shireen Nishant is originally from Iran, but she left in 1974, um, shortly before Iran became an Islamic Republic, uh, to study art. And she was not able to return to that country until 1990. And when she went back, she was really struck um, by the differences that she saw. And she talks about it, everything seeming very black and white, right? The color had kind of been removed from, from things. And so her early works are black and white photographs that kind of re reflect the starkness that she um, encountered upon her return to, to Iran. And this work, like many of those earlier works from the 1990s, um, is influenced by the, um, by the veiling of women in Iran. They have to wear the chador, which is a, a floor length gown, right? It covers the head all the way down to the feet. And so she wanted to focus on the parts of the, women, the woman's body that were left exposed by the chador. And so the hands, as you see here, um, are one of those parts of the body. And you can see that there's writing on the hand here. And this is very, very um, common in Shireen Nishat's practice. And what you see is her own script, her own handwriting in Farsi of um, transcriptions of Farsi poetry, usually by uh, women, women poets. And I think one of the intriguing things about Nishat's work is that even though her images can be kind of um, deceptively simple, um, you know, they're black and white, this one's particularly close up, she's really getting at the complexity that lies behind um, the intersection of religion and gender in uh, Islamic societies like the one in, in Iran. Um, this work is predates just by a few years uh, her first film piece that she did called Turbulent. And I, it's somewhat related to it because you can see here the hands are clasping a microphone. And in that film work, um, which if you have a chance, um, you know, Google it and, and I think there's at least a, a portion of it maybe available on the internet, but it's this very stark, again, black and white contrast between a male singer singing in front of an audience and a female singer singing in, on the same stage, but with no audience. And so it's kind of getting at these ideas about, um, you know, who's allowed to perform what um, in, front of, in front of whom. Um, so there are a lot of different layers to her work. Um, they are um, as beautiful as they are thought provoking for sure. Okay, next work. Wait, is that four already? Wow, okay. Okay, so this is the last work that I'm going to talk about, also from um, the mid 1990s. And this is a quilt, actually a painted quilt by the artist Faith Ringgold. And I, one of the highlights of my career here in Nimwa uh, was meeting Faith Ringgold a few years ago when we had her exhibition um, here of her earlier paintings from the 1960s. And she was really just a pleasure to listen to, really amazing. She had on these great like sequined Ugg boots. Um, and I, I just thought she was the best. Um, Faith is interestingly, um, we started in Harlem in the Netherlands, so now we'll end in Harlem in New York, uh, Harlem with one A, where Faith Ringgold was born. Uh, she got her master's at the City University of New York in 1959. And in the 60s was painting really bold, politically inspired paintings um, that spoke to the issues surrounding the civil rights movement. Um, and I urge you to, to you know, go online and look at some of those paintings. They're really phenomenal. Um, really strong and, and to think she was doing them in the 1960s is really quite amazing. Um, she is a, an artist activist for sure. Uh, she 
was one of the many who demonstrated against the exclusion of black and female artists by the, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, as well as the Museum of Modern Art. And those protests took place in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, in the 70s, she began using textiles in her artistic practice and she made um, dolls, masks, and then a little later in the early 80s, she began making these, these quilts. And she incorporated writing into a lot of these quilts. This one um, doesn't happen to have any writing. And so she called them story quilts because they were really kind of telling stories about, um, you know, the people that she knew, the people in her neighborhood, um, who of course were the kind of people that, whose stories don't often get told. Um, of course, the use of um, textiles and quilting in particular um, has long been associated with traditional quote unquote women's work, right? Um, and quilting, the quilting tradition, particularly within the African American community, um, has a very long and rich tradition. So she's tapping into all of these things um, in her quilt pieces. So what we have here. Uh, this is from her American Collection series, and this one's called Joe Baker's Bananas. And you see the famous um, image of Josephine Baker, who was a, a very famous performer and actress um, in the 1930s and 40s. Um, she was American, but she lived most of her life in France. Again, um, a lot of African-American artists were traveling to Europe, particularly France, uh, in the early 20th century because they found uh, the atmosphere much more comfortable, uh, much less discrimination against them. And Josephine Baker was one of those. And you can see her in this kind of stop motion sequence running across the top of the quilt. And this is, you know, it really captures the sense of movement in this dance that she's performing. And this was actually um, a dance that she performed wearing a skirt of bananas um, at the Folie Bergère in 1926. And um, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of scholarship and a lot of discussion surrounding the fact that she is um, in effect, you know, kind of playing on these tropes of quote unquote, natives or primitive peoples of Africa um, in performing this dance. And, you know, how, how much was she kind of uh, um, doing it in a tongue in cheek kind of way? Um, so this is uh, Faith Ringgold's representation of that um, really famous or infamous, however you want to look at it, um, dance at the Folie Bergère in 1926. Um, and of course, even though it doesn't have any writing on it, it is kind of telling this story um, about Josephine Baker, this very important uh, African-American um, entertainer. Um, and also, I believe she was a spy even um, during the war. Um, so kind of recording her history here uh, in this really gorgeous uh, story quilt that we are fortunate to have in our connection collection, excuse me. So that's five women artists um, that you can now name and hopefully tell your friends about. And like I said, if you can already name five, great, go for 10, go for 20, go for broke. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Carolyn Higgins, our senior membership manager. Thank you all for listening, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone attending. I'll say happy International Women's Day again. I know you've heard it a lot this morning and I hope you'll hear it a lot more today. So we wanted to mention how you can participate in the Five Women Artists uh, campaign and programs throughout the year. Um, follow us online at our accounts. Uh, you see our, our handle for all of our, the social media is pretty much women in the arts, um, but you can see here on everything. Use the hashtag five women artists. I just posted something right now. Um, as you go all year long, don't just do it today. Don't just do it this month. All year long, support women, support women artists, gender, uh, inequity in the arts, you know, work to, to correct that in any related content you see, share, like, comment. Um, and some more real world uh, outside of social media, make sure that you're supporting 
women artists in your area, especially with things hopefully getting back to normal um, in the next few months or even next year, you know, visit exhibitions and attend programs at institutions that show work by women, go to galleries that are showing women artists in your area and things like that, support women throughout the year. So I just wanna give a little run through of other programs that we're hosting today virtually um, at NIMWA. We really hope that you'll attend more than just today and we thank you, or excuse me, this morning, um, and that you'll attend some of our other great programming that we have. So at one o'clock, um, Emily Moore, our archival, archival assistant at the Betty Boyd Dietrich Library and Research Center will be talking about this amazing collection we have um, from the UN Conference on Women that Susan mentioned um, earlier. This is actually something I don't know a lot about, so I'm very excited to watch and learn and see. I always say this, our Library and Research Center is truly a hidden gem at the museum, and Emily is going to give us a great presentation. So we'll make sure to link all the registration links um, in the chat, but also you can find everything at nimwa.org as well. Um, at two, we have another great partnership with the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum, where Katrina Latka, uh, a staff member at the museum, is going to be talking to Peter Lopez, who knew Georgia O'Keeffe, worked for Georgia O'Keeffe, and is actually a third generation employee. So we're going to learn a lot about uh, behind the scenes in the life of O'Keeffe and Peter's important uh, life with her as well. Um, so that will be really wonderful and a great partnership with the O'Keeffe Museum, who many of you maybe came to our O'Keeffe Happy Hour, which was really wonderful. And they're a really great sister organization to us. So we're happy to have them back today. Then at 5.30, uh, we have a little happy hour moment for you <laughs> to toast to women artists. Um, AJ Johnson, a local bartender here in DC. Some of you might know her from our previous happy hours. She's really amazing mixologist, uh, bar director at Serenata here in DC. And she has picked artist Julia Lopez um, and has created two cocktails for us. And she's gonna teach us how to make them um, and teach us more about Julia Lopez's life and art. Even if you don't want to in, uh, have any cocktails, she's really awesome to just watch and learn from and so entertaining and wonderful. So I highly uh, recommend spending a half an hour or so with AJ tonight. And then last but not least, we'll be having uh, Courtney Dow, who is a local singer songwriter and human rights advocate um, do a live performance for us at 6.30. Uh, she's really amazing. She's performed with, um, with us in the past and it'll just be a great, it's live stream. You don't even have to register, just hop on um, and watch. And then I'll just mention two other programs that we're releasing today that are pre-recorded, but haven't been released. Um, so you can enjoy them anytime. Um, we have a conversation with our assistant curator, Oren Zara and Rania Matar and Embreen Butt um, in conversation about global politics, identity, um, Middle Eastern misconceptions and things, as you can see, it's a really amazing conversation. I was very fortunate to watch in the background so I can uh, promote it and just say it's really amazing. You get to learn a lot about Matar and Butt's work as well directly from them. And then just a really great conversation between the two. And then in honor and celebration of our newest exhibition that just opened last week, uh, Sonia Clark, Tatter, Bristle and Mend, our chief curator, Katie Watt, um, presents on this exhibition. So we know, sadly, a lot of people can't come see this show in person, um, but Katie gives a great run through of the themes, the importance and power of Sonia Clark's work and, and parts of this exhibition. So we really hope that you'll take the time today or later down the road to watch these two programs. Um, and we hope that you'll attend some of our other programs today Everything is free. We just want you to celebrate women today and always. So I think that's it from our end for this presentation. I'm going to share so everyone can see us before we close out. But we thank everybody for coming. Thank my presenters and Laura in the background who was linking everything. Um, and thank all everyone for coming and and supporting NIMWA and what we do to champion women through the arts now and forever. So I think that's all. I, so thank you everyone. And we hope to see you at other, other events today. Enjoy your International Women's Day. Bye everyone. Bye everybody.